what are some pitfalls like in the beginning of that, you know, suddenly, you, you know, you're getting a, a, a large audience and are you reading the comments? Are you responding back? Like, what are the mistakes and, and like, what are you trying to like, revamp yourself during like this period of like, oh, wait, I, I better not do that again. Or I can't engage. You're like, what is this thing? What is happening during this? Yeah, I'm reading every single comment, <laughs> um, you know, replying to most of them. Uh, you know, I, I fed trolls all the time. You know, um, and I still do to to some extent. Do you still read you know? the comments and, and oh, yeah. try and reply back to everyone? Absolutely, yeah. as much as possible. Yeah. It's a little harder these days, but as much yeah. as possible. Um, you know, because I get a lot of great ideas from people. Sometimes their their comments are not said in the nicest of ways, but the the I get the heart of what they're saying, and I say, you know what, I probably could do that a little bit better next time, and uh, and I try to apply that. But you know, I, I would say, um, you know, really in the beginning, what ends up what ended up being the hardest thing for me was like seeing people that I looked up to in photography that all of a sudden became my friends and became my peers. Uh, that, that was, um, that was good and bad, yeah. you know, because sometimes people are, you know, normal, decent people and they're well-intentioned and, um, you know, uh, you just happen to be running in the same circle, doing the same types yeah. of things. No, and it, it, obviously we run in, in very similar circles here. And, and I, I know certain yeah. people when I was starting out and I looked, looked to, and, and so they turned out to be very different and, uh, you know, it, yeah. it, it kind of, it, it hurts and it's upsetting and you kind of feel like, Oh wow, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> that whole thing of like, don't meet your heroes, you know? Yes. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But and, then and, some turn out to be a, a lot more than you ever expected. And, you know, for yeah, sure. from the day I met you, you, you have not changed in terms of your kindness and, giving this and, and, and forthfulness. And, uh, you know, I think that's why, you know, I, I, I consider you a friend and, and, and someone, a colleague in this industry, I, I always look to, and, and, and you know, I've called you up for advice, you know, it's like, yeah. Hey, you know, but boom, I need, I need a thought on this. And you've always, always and I've made up kind of answers every single forward. time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just you made it out right this. away. I don't know why, you know, <laughs> give it up, just give it up. <laughs> No, so I, I appreciate that more headshots and you're getting more defined in your look and your, your lighting and stuff like that. So uh, where are we at this point? Yeah, this is uh, again, you know, a after I've built up my team, now I've got a another hairstylist and makeup artist um, starting to do uh, actors headshots. Uh, the caliber of, you know, talent that I'm working with continues to, to increase and, and get better. Um, you know, being uh, sought after by people that, uh, you know, have been doing this for a little while. Um, so JC was one of the first, uh, you know, great models that I worked with here in Orlando. Uh, we had the opportunity to make a video together that I would say kind of boosted and, and, and maybe blow up on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, we did a video where I was basically comparing the results from a 7D with a cheap lens versus a 5D3 with an expensive lens. And he was the model in that video. And uh, the video got shared by Petapixel and gave me like thousands of subscribers basically at like overnight yeah. um, and, and just kind of put me on the map in terms of, of like the YouTube game. Um, but, you know, at, at this point in time, I'm learning about, you know, all sorts of things. I'm really now focusing more on the, the creative side of things versus, you know, just trying to figure out technically how to get a good photo. Um, this was a, a wardrobe stylist who uh, Joey, had reached out to me and he's like, Hey, she wanted headshots, but I'm booked. Um, you know, and now I have people recommending people to work with me, you know, and, yeah. and now I have that added pressure of like, Oh man, my mentor is now referring people right. to me. I, you I know? remember, you know, when uh, Tony Gale recommended me for something the first time, I'm like, Oh man, I can't. Yeah. Mind. Don't can't mess, mess up, up, man. Can't mess this up. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and then, it's, and then it's pressure. And I don't want to say on this one, but other times, sometimes you like, it, it it's almost it's it's tough because there are times you know when someone recommends you for something and that client likes you more and suddenly yeah. wants to call you and say that person and that how do you deal with something like that? Yeah, you know, I, it's I, happened I, to me. <laughs> yeah, it happened. It's happened to me too. Um, you know, working with people, especially when it, it comes to photography, it's a very personal thing. You know, it's not to say that one person's better than the yeah. other. It's just some people. Uh, their personalities jive better with other people. And so you, you always, the overarching thing is you always work with people that you like, whether it's photography, whether it's anything business related, you always feel better doing business with people that you actually care for and that you like. And so, um, you know, for me, I, I've, I've had, you know, luck. I've been very blessed and fortunate that I met a lot of people that I don't know in life that walk away feeling 
great about the experience or good about yeah. the experience. Um, so, you know, so it was, it was a thing, but I've always been honest with people like, and people know my, my nature. Like I'm not, I'm not a snake. Like I, I would happily take my shirt off and, and yeah. give it to somebody if I know it would help them. So I think people understanding that they know, like, I'm not going to go out there and, and like, take your customers away from you. Like that would be the last thing. And I even those times where I've had customers who are like, yeah, you know, I like working with you better. I've, I've still tried to talk them into <laughs> going back. Cause I'm just like thinking, I don't want that pressure, yeah. man. Like just, no, please. We're good. We, we did our business, go back to them. No, but I really like working with you. And at that point, then you're a jerk. If they're wanting to come to you and do business and you push them away. Like, you brought up one word there that I want to kind of circle back to. And it's, mm-hmm. it's one that I, I live by the experience. Yes. And, and, and what is the experience to you? I mean, when, when you start talking to a client to when you show up to when you deliver a picture, what is that? How is that uh, experience and how do you customize it? Because it's very different. And I think nine times out of 10, it's the experience that they come back to you for, not the photo. Yes. True. The experience is everything. And, and I think from day one, I identified the fact that if I was going to be successful in photography, the experience had to be something that was carefully crafted, something that was thought through. And, and I had to understand the experience in total. So the experience is not just, you know, you being in front of them, actually working with them. It actually comes, it starts from the moment that you pop up on their radar, whether it be through an email, a conversation that they're having with one of their friends, um, you know, that experience, even though I might not have even met them, right? They're just hearing from somebody else. So yeah, I worked with this guy, Miguel, and he was, you know, very friendly and he was thoughtful and he was this, that, and the other, like that's their experience now of me, even though they've never worked with me. So I tried in the very beginning to cultivate that and to nurture that as much as humanly possible. And so, you know, it was from the, the logo that I used at the time, making sure that it looked like one that was classy, one that... Yep you know, uh, kind of had all of the elements that I wanted to show off in, in my own work. Um, it, at the time I had shot in my home. So like it was, how did my house look? You know, <laughs> did I mow the grass before a photo shoot? Did I, uh, clean my house and clean my bathroom and make sure that it smelled good, make sure that it looked presentable, you know? And of course, when I had my studio, the same type of things, um, you know, the, the whole experience was something yeah. that was engineered to make sure that when people got through the process that they felt as good or better than when they started the process. And, and I think when you can do that, there's no limit to what you can make in photography, you know, and, and it all comes down to the experience. It has very little, if anything, to do with the actual caliber of your work. Yeah. And if you don't believe me, look up you know, look up the guy who sold a, a picture of a, pot- of a potato on a black background for millions of dollars. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not, <laughs> it ain't because it's the most amazing uh, photo in, in the history of humanity. It's so. true. It's true. So now we're going into another photo here. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, why don't you tell me a little about this? Yeah. So this was now, uh, I've, I've transitioned to Sony. Um, I'm shooting with the A7 II now. Um, and, and still doing my off camera flash stuff and really just, uh, kind of almost starting over in a way, because I I had really learned how to shoot with a DSLR and the experience with, you know, Sony mirrorless at the time was so different that I was like, it presented different, different problems, you know, technically speaking, um, you know, it took a lot of the technical side of things off my plate, but then it really put me at a point to where now I'm like, oh, so now I have all these other things that I could focus on, like how the person looks in the photo, how, what kind of emotions are they giving to the camera? Um, you know, now I'm looking at every little micro movement <laughs> within the photo and, uh, and trying to make sure that it looks its absolute best. And these were all things that I really, up to that point, like if it happened, it happened just by sheer luck right. because I was busy. I was, you know, head down in my camera trying to figure out the technical stuff. Now I have a, a tool that that technical stuff is not on my plate anymore. And I'm like, wow, there's this whole other world, like me trying to communicate with the person. How do I get them to look um, and, and emote in a certain type of way? And uh, now I'm able to explore that. And so that was very exciting at the time. Yeah. it's uh, And I, I, one of the things I love is you're, you're always 
pushing the craft in terms of working with light. And obviously mm -hmm. as photographers, what we do is working with light. And, and some people are, you know, like, oh, I only work with natural light. I only like, but you, you tend to, I think, really love working with light and, mm -hmm. and, and, and shaping it and crafting it. And how do you keep, what is your way of pushing yourself to continue to develop the craft in the study of light? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it, you know, the heart of it is necessity, you know, especially now being back in Orlando, Florida. Um, you know, the reason why I started really down the road of this obsession with lighting was that, you know, I'll take a day like today when I started this interview with you, it was nice and sunny outside. And right now, as I look over to my right, it is storming, you know, and I'm sure in another 10 or 15 minutes, I'll look outside and the sun will be back out like it never happened. And so that uh, moodiness in nature was very difficult for me because I would set up photo shoots and, you know, people would cancel because of the weather. And, and I said, well, if I can make my own light, you won't cancel on me because I could do it as long as I got power somewhere, you know, whether it be a battery <laughs> pack, I can plug it into the wall. As long as they don't shut my electricity off, we can make some images. And so, um, you know, for me, that always uh, kind of pushed me to learn new ways to light you know, and I would bounce back and do, you know, natural light for a period of time. And I would see stuff, you know, lighting scenarios and setups that natural light would provide me with. And I think to myself, I wonder if I could do that with a strobe. And so, um, you know, then it just became one of these things where I would just uh, try to figure out, like, can I do that with a strobe, you know, and uh, it, it's just this curiosity. I think really what it boils down to is just curiosity of like, how could I do something a little bit different? How can I uh, make it replicate something that I saw somewhere else? Um, or, you know, how could I take fake light, you know, if you want to call it that and make it look more natural? Yeah. I mean, obviously curious. you're pushing yourself. Who are you looking to? Like uh, we all kind of have influences. Like who do you look to now for as influence in like, wow, man, I, I, that was it blew me away. That creativity. That's I, I need to get to that point. It's like, we always kind of like, if we're going to keep pushing ourselves to a next point, who are you looking to like is the next point at this point? <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at uh, like the Marco Grobs of the world. I'm looking at um, uh, Michael Muller. I'm looking at um, Annie Leibovitz. Yeah. Looking at uh, uh, Nino Munoz is a great photographer. Um you know, a lot of people that like the average person probably would never have heard of, but if they have subscriptions to, you know, Elle and Vogue and Harper's Bazaar or Forbes or whatever, you'd, you're like, oh, I've seen their work before. Um, you know, it's that, that next rung in, in, in photography in my mind. Um, so, yeah, those are the types of uh, photographers that I'm looking at, but I'm always seeing, you know, and I'm always inspired even by new photographers that have just started out. You yeah. know, the people that are starting out today in photography are going to be so much more advanced in a very short period of time, you know, and so they're doing a lot of things creatively that I look at and I say, wow, that's, that's cool. Like, I don't want to do it exactly the way they're doing it, but, you know, that's part of inspiration, right? You see something specific and you're like, ooh, I could take this little piece and, and install it in what I'm doing and it will lead to a big result. That's me still. Yeah. You As a photographer, I mean, a lot of, some people we see that like naturally they pick up a camera and like, I can't believe they saw that. And like, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. are you the type that's like, I've had to work at my composition or it was something like you, like I always saw things a different way. Well, where do you kind of put yourself in that? I, every time I pick up the camera, there's this, uh, this weird duality, right? I know what I'm doing to some extent, right? Um, but at the same time, when I pick up my camera, when I'm trying to learn things, I divest myself of all that knowledge. And I say to myself, okay, I'm going to pour out this glass of knowledge that I have, and I want you to fill it up with new, new knowledge. And obviously, I'm going to compare that to what I already know, but I always approach life and photography as a student. And, and so, you know, I think that's what's helped me to, to try to figure things out and to mold myself in different ways as the years have gone on. It's always just taking that mindset, you know, and I think it's been funny because I've met, you know, some of my like heroes in photography and a lot of them are very surprised when, you know, we start talking and I basically talk to them like I'm absolutely new and don't know what I'm talking about, you know, <laughs> and it's like, no, in order for me to really appreciate what you bring to the table, 
Like, I'm not going to be that guy who's going to have the conversation with you if you're that person and be like, well, here's all that I know. And we're going to have this like, you know, uh, weenie swinging competition of who knows more, right? Like that doesn't help anyone. Yeah. So like you have to, you have to say, okay, if, if I'm going to receive uh, knowledge and information from somebody, then I'm going to dump out my cup of knowledge and, and I want to listen at this person's feet as if I'm absolutely new. And that's helped me so much, you know, Come, coming into these situations, I've learned so much and I've been able to apply certain things, you know, different perspectives that I've applied to what I do that maybe would not have been the case if I would have gone into it differently. Yeah, I think there's something so beautiful in, in just the humbleness of saying, you know, and I know what I'm doing, but I also know what I'm not doing. And, I, and yeah. I know that I can still learn. And one of the beautiful things about photography is like, as long as we have the capability to pick up a camera and see and shoot, mm -hmm. we can develop and we can keep growing. And, and that's one of the most beautiful things. And we, you know, uh, from seeing, I'm sure it's the same for you, seeing work from just six months ago to a year ago, how we mm -hmm. keep growing and progressing. I can't wait to see what I'm shooting in five, 10, 15 years from now. Oh, it's yeah. Just, it's it's going to be insane. It's going to be mind boggling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll go to, I think this is the last picture of this, and we'll go into a couple of your videos. Um, mm -hmm. This is the most recent work you're doing. Why don't you tell me where we're at at this point now? Yeah. So, you know, for many years, uh, I've been an off camera flash guy for the most part, you know, I'd say 80 20. I'm mostly off camera flash, some natural light. Um, and, and now that I've moved back home to Orlando, I have this new studio that I'm still in the process of getting it, you know, set up. But in the backside of the studio, I have a roll up door and this big, huge window and, and, and door. And um, one of my mentors that I learned from when I moved up north uh, primarily did a lot of what I thought was studio lit stuff that was actually done with natural light. And uh, so that's where I'm at now, where it's like many years later, I'm in a environment where I can actually use natural light, but still have a studio backdrop set up and uh, try to make some stuff that looks a little different. So at know? which point did, did someone either teach you or did you learn to look at the pupils? Because like right now <laughs> you can see all of that, you know, you can see almost everything in that eye. Like, did you yeah. start looking to like, oh, where's the modifier? Where's the light coming from? How did you start learning the breakdown of, because you talked about decomposing and, and, and kind mm -hmm. of ripping apart a, uh, uh, a, a photo to figure out how to do it. And um, where did you figure that out for yourself? Was it taught to you or did you just kind of just out of necessity, start ripping things apart and experimenting to figure it out. Yeah, it was exactly the latter. It's like, you know, you, you try to train your eyes to be able to, to see things in the right sort of way um, and try to identify the things that matter. You know, sometimes looking at a photo and, and trying to do that is like looking at calculus for the first time. It's just like, I don't even know which way is upside down, right side up. Um, but as you look at things, you, you could say, okay, well, what do I like about this photo? You know, and sometimes you could explain it in words. Other times it's like a feeling or a mood. But, you know, I knew straight away that when it came to shooting portraits that, you know, the eyes are the window to the soul. And so I tried through using off-camera flash modifiers to create catch lights that look like natural light. But natural light creates amazing catch lights, like in a way that I don't think is entirely possible with, you know, modifiers. And so... Yeah. Uh, for me, that's where I was just like, you know, I, I really want to make the eyes glow and look as amazing as possible. And I think shooting in available light in the right scenarios can create catch lights that look otherworldly. And so it, for me, it's a very weird process. And I've made videos about this before where like people, when they look at a photograph that they just took, they look at the overall photo and they say, yeah, I like it or no, I don't like it. For me, I start off in the like super zoomed in right on the eyeball. And, and I look at that catch light and I could tell before I even zoom out to look at the photograph, I can tell whether it's a photo that I'm going to like or not. <laughs> and if I see catch lights like that photo that I just showed you and I zoom out, I'm like, of course I love it. Look, look, these catch lights are crazy. <laughs> like it looks beautiful, you know? And so um, that's, that's part of it, whether I'm shooting with a flash or shooting an available, uh, available light, you know, I'm trying to make sure that the eyes uh, pop and the easiest way to make them pop is not to do some crazy colors and stuff in Photoshop. Uh, it's all about how you like the person and what catch lights and, and things are being picked up in the, the reflection of the eyes. Yeah.
And it's funny because I came from, you know, uh, my love, even before I realized photography was uh, was film. And I knew about cinematographers before I ever knew about photographers. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, working on film and stuff like that and, and watching these people build light and, and, and the way they layered it to create scenes and stuff like that. And in, and in film, you're not going for that beautiful, huge catch light in each right. actor's eyes. You're going so, so I, I went for the more cinematic and now I'm starting to learn about, you know, the, 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 the beauty of catch lights and, and different lightings, but I kind of go in between this cinematic to, you know, photographic kind of world. Sure. Uh, so I'm going to jump into video here with you and yeah. we're going to go into some of your, your, your early stuff here and uh, let's uh, kind of discuss uh, this stuff. So this is working early years at Adorama. Or where this yeah. is about a year into it. Uh, yeah, I think that was about a year into um, uh, my videos with Adorama. Um, we we worked via yearly contracts, so I think that was one of the last videos. In how many my, are you uh, doing? A, you know, what, how many are you producing a month, or how many a week, or two two a month? Two a month. Yeah, two a month. Um, so uh, for a year. Yeah. And so that was one of the last videos, I think, of the first uh, contract that I had with them uh, prior to having the show renewed. And um, yeah, at that point in time, uh, I was shooting all my own content for the most part. Um, you know, I would take my camera, put it on a tripod, you know, and, and really the, the sequence of events was that I would do the photo shoot, take the pictures, knew that I had the photo that I liked, and then I would step back and say, okay, what about this is something that I could teach? Like if someone sees this photograph, uh, what do they need to know if they want to recreate this photo? So I would set the camera up on the tripod and I'd say, okay, today we're going to talk about uh, shooting with an umbrella because <clears throat> that's how I made the photo. And so, um, you know, we would basically set the camera on the tripod. I would say what I'm going to say, move the, move the tripod around. You know, it was a very primitive uh, sequence of events to create these videos, but, uh, but it worked, you know, yeah. it was more about the content and it was more about explaining these different ideas and very less about the visual, you know, it was much less about the visual, uh, you know, tickling people's eyes with pretty visuals and stuff. It wasn't about that. It was about the knowledge, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Which we're going, I'm going to go into now. You're sort of, I'm going to show two, two videos right here. So we'll go mm -hmm. into the first one and go to the second one, and then we'll talk about it. But it, it's to really show the evolution and also how you're pushing yourself. So I want to discuss it after we go through both of these. So let's go into that. So obviously we have two different time periods. And what I want to talk about is, the evolution of where you've come from producing your own stuff. And, and you can s clearly see the strides you're making in storytelling and shooting and sound and music. Um, how did you develop that? And what's really kind of forced you to, to, to make these changes? Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it very much goes back to kind of what I was saying before about having a team of people to be able to help you. I was doing so much on my own for so long and uh, I felt like I was hitting a wall in terms of the type of content that I can create and in terms of the things that I envisioned that I would be able to do in these videos. And uh, at the time I was doing classes at Adorama once a month. And uh, one of the guys who was like the AV guy there at the event space was like, Hey, you know, I shoot video. Um, you know, if you need help with shooting your YouTube stuff, let me know. And for months I was like, no, I'm good. I'm good. You know, didn't even think about it. I was like, oh, I, I'll, I'm good. Um, but eventually it, it got to the point where I was like, you know what? He kept asking and he caught me just like back when I worked at the camera store and the guy kept bugging me over at GameStop. And finally I'm like, okay, fine. Right. So it was another one of those scenarios where I was just like, okay, fine. Come to my studio. I've got these videos I want to shoot. And um, you know, this was Chewy yes. and he, he ended up uh, uh, being great, you know, shooting videos and really helping me to do things that, have you, you know, lost Chewy now that do. you've gone to Florida? No. So funny enough, uh, he's going to be flying down here on Wednesday. So uh, in a couple of days, he'll be he'll be here, and we're going to continue right where we left off, shooting That's more awesome. videos over the next uh, week or so. Is and, he just um, visiting down there, or is he? Uh, uh, no, he's coming there? specifically to come and shoot, to shoot content. This content. Yeah, oh, fantastic. yeah. Fantastic. I mean, he'll be visiting too, but you know, primarily he's coming to help me to uh, film. I've got a a bunch of projects that I'm working on, a bunch of videos for myself and also for some other people that, um, you know, if I'm going to get it done uh, and get it done with the standards that I have, then I need help. 
and, yeah. and he, he's so and just a, so I don't want to go deep into it, but for someone mm -hmm. that's really kind of uh, uh, tr trying to go the same, travel the same at least you know road as you uh, in terms of kind of producing YouTube and, and making a brand for themselves. What are like some of the things like that would you tell them to if they're you're starting now? These are the things that you should really kind of identify and, and really kind of focus on. Yeah, I, you know, I, I would say the the main things you need to focus on is make sure that you. Uh, understand yourself and what you do, um, you know. And and when when I say that, it's like you need to you need to promote your own brand. Yeah. Right. I think what people are doing now that may not be correct uh, is that they promote the brands that they see their like heroes or or the people that they look up to. They see, oh, well, they're promoting X Y Z brand let me go promote XYZ brand as, as somebody who's starting out. And, you know, it, it messes them up because they're creating this, you know, if they're doing it well, they're promoting a brand and that brand may never reciprocate, yeah. right? You, you're just giving them free, free promotion. And at the end of the day, what did it do for you and your own personal brand? Probably nothing. You know, like if you're separate of that brand and, and I've seen many people that have done this where like they had a change of heart and they start using a different brand and it's like they lose all their following. They lose all of this momentum that they built up because they're no longer using the, the gear that, you know, they were identified by. Um, you know, so the biggest thing is really to just focus on your own brand and focus on, you know, the nuts and bolts of being able to do this, you know, focus on. Uh, being able to communicate, focus on being able to figure out, okay, here's the topic. How can I explain this topic so that a five-year-old can understand it? You know, and, and, you know, then from that point, you can start refining things. You know, I really focus more on the content in the beginning and the information that you would see in that content. And then I started thinking about the visuals and thinking about storytelling and, and how can I add some extra wrinkles to this you know, process. And obviously, as I did that, I realized, okay, I need help. I need a videographer. I need a good editor. I need somebody who can, you know, execute these dreams that I have in my mind of how these videos could come out. But, you know, the biggest thing I could tell you is, or, or anybody who's uh, looking to do this is that you have to focus on your own brand first, because if you're going to be successful, especially when it comes to being a content creator, people will work with you because they, you know, you do good business, you do things when you say you're going to do them yeah. and that you have your own strong brand. Like they have their brand, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, you can't ride on the coattails of that. You have to create and pave your own path. And then you have to show the path and be like, Hey, X, Y, Z brand, would you like to travel down this, you know, path that I made on my own <laughs> and with my team and, you know, with my friends or, or whatever that looks like. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I think that is what leads to the type of success that, you know, could be sustained for a long period of time. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, it, it's so important to know you and, and know what you're about and, and your voice, because, you know, a lot of times that's what people are looking for is they don't know they're looking for it, but that's what they're looking for is, is someone yeah. that's unique and, and has their own voice. Uh, I want to quickly kind of go into uh, um, just the, the state of the world right now. And, you yeah. know, as crazy it may be from politics to, to race relations to uh, COVID, um, right before this, what were you shooting? Where was your, your life and career right before you kind of realized that the, this pandemic is really hitting us? Yeah, so up to that point, uh, I was going into some of the most uh, heavy travel uh, seasons of, of my, my career. Um, I was at... Imaging USA for the first time in January, uh, taught a class in Miami later that month. Um, February, started the month doing a PPA event in Connecticut, um, had a, a, a big commercial job that I took care of in uh, late January that was carrying over into February. And then of course, WPPI. So it was, uh, <clears throat> you know, it was gearing up to be uh, up until the summer you know, a uh, very busy, hectic time, you know, and then of course, in the midst of that, trying to plan a move uh, from Jersey to, to Florida, which was nuts. Um, and then selling a home and, and trying to go through all of that. But, you know, everything was very frantic and very hectic and like, okay, what do I need to get ready for next week? Because next week I've got A, B, C, and D and I, I, I have to plan it now. And then it went from that to, 
well, everything is canceled and, and life is on hold as, as, as we know it. And, you know, I had all of these plans moving to Florida to kind of hit the ground running. Yeah. And everything just uh, had to have a different timeline. You know, I, I tried to find a new studio as soon as I got here. And um, realtors were not even showing studios. Like, not studios, but they weren't showing properties. And, yeah. So, like, they would say, hey, we'll do, like, a virtual walkthrough. And, uh, and if you like it, it's a three- to five-year lease. And I'm like, do you want me to sign a three- to five-year lease and I can't even walk through the place? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Thanks, COVID. <laughs> You know, so, um, so, so there's that, uh, and that was challenging, you know, and I ended up finding a place that, you know, is not my forever home here in Orlando, but it, it's fine for, for what I'm doing right now. Um, you know, and as far as everything else that's, that's been happening outside of COVID with um, just politics and, and uh, race relations in, in America, um, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy right now. Um, I, I mean, I'm not one to ever be scared because I always feel like, you know, in general, I feel like uh, the media is meant to sensationalize things. You know, the media won't exist if we don't watch and we don't listen. And just like it is being somebody who's a photographer who lives by that. Like if you're, if you're not looking at my stuff, right? If you're not looking at my content on YouTube or not looking at my images, then I disappear. <laughs> like I just vaporize, right? No, the media is very much like that. In another, in one of the earlier episodes, I was talking to Ben Lowy and mm -hmm. uh, he was like, you know, when he was a, a, a wartime journalist, he was like, I, I don't want to say it, but I was going to shoot death and that's correct. What I was selling, you know, it's like, that's mm -hmm. what I was going for. And, and, and I have to deal with that now every day and, and the thoughts and, and how that's affected me. But it's yeah. true with this 24 hour news cycle and stuff like that. Uh, where are you? Well, like, how did you have, did you go through like the stages of acceptance on, on COVID? Like it was suddenly like, oh, this is not that serious. This is serious. Oh my God, am I going to work again? Oh my, oh my God, I'm going through a depression. Like what's the, there, there's going to be a new norm or nothing's going to be the same. What, what was your transition? And, and to this point, which we still don't have answers. Yeah, yeah. Um, to go back real quick to what you were saying about Ben Lowy, you know, I, 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 always, uh, I always say that as content creators and, and as media of sorts, that we're dope dealers, we're, we're dopamine dealers, right? And so all we're doing is we're trying to, to elicit a response of, of dopamine in, in the viewer or the watcher's eyes. And some people, their dope, dopamine doesn't spike unless they see death and destruction. And, you know, that's like the easiest way to, to spike someone. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, that's the reality of, of yeah. the human condition, right? Uh, but in terms of uh, COVID, you know, specifically, like I was very nervous when it first came about. I took it extremely seriously. Um, there were many people in my circle that didn't. And, and it was very annoying to me because, yeah. you know, I said to myself, like, this is a, a, a scary thing. You know, this is not this is like a once in a lifetime thing that we're going through right now where yeah, they're shutting we discussed, everything down. You went from one hot zone to another. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, I thought I, I dodged a bullet when I got here and I'm watching these numbers spike in my old town in New Jersey. And, uh, you know, here in Florida, very few things were different. I mean, some stores uh, had closed, you know, restaurants had closed and things like that. But, um, you know, you can still order. You can still go through the drive through uh, you know, most of the stores that I would want to shop at were still open. Um, so it wasn't as bad as maybe it might have been in some other places. But, um, you know, it definitely had me nervous because of all of the, the holdups with trying to find a new space and um, just trying to figure out like, well, what's it going to look like to be a studio portrait photographer? You know, I have to deal with people. And most of the time they're at, you know, somewhat arm's length from me. Yeah. So like, what am I going to have to change in my process now? That are I've you, are you changing your, the way you work in a studio? Like, yeah, are you, you know, it, it, now it's like social distancing and cleaning everything yeah. in between everything your whole, you know, the way you're, you're approaching your shoots is completely different now, right? Yeah. Having this nearby, literally like as a, uh, you know, I don't know where you've been. So, you know, <laughs> to give you a little spray. No, but I mean, seriously, it's like everything, keyboards, uh, you know, coming up with a cleaning uh, practice, which, you know, before I used to clean maybe once a week. I don't week. know if it works, but I bought one of these UV lights that I can actually go. You over. can actually see? See? Yeah. It's a, I it's might a have UV to take a look at that. It kills thing. It kills the, you know, the germs. So see? It, it uh, these are all things and, like a year yeah. from, not even six, seven months ago, you would never. Yeah. Like it would never even be a, 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 something that you would think of. But, 
you know, I, I've got a, a temperature, uh, one of the little guns. Yeah, me too. As soon as someone comes yep. in, before I start working with them, Same I temperature thing. check everybody that comes in. You yep. know, um, I, I clean the floors. And now I'm doing this literally on a daily basis to where before, maybe once a week, yep. You know, where, where are you at in conversations with clients is, has it, it has, have they started, you know, saying and we're coming back or is it, you still feel like 2000 is almost a wash. Like, uh, like I know certain things that, uh, you know, were on my schedule. have been pushed a year, like to two, the yes. 2021. So For a lot of people are, have been pushed. So it's kind of interesting because uh, a percentage of my business is uh, content creation for brands. And so on that side of things, because they no longer have trade shows and and have those venues to be able to show off their new gear and things of that nature, um, they're relying more on content creators to go out there and help them to market. So it's weird because a, a portion of my business now has transitioned to becoming more of a, uh, you know, content creator for these brands. Um, but, you know, I, I'm fortunate and I'm blessed that I have the the background to be able to do it and I have the gear to be able to do it and um, that I'm, I'm set up for that. But, uh, but yeah, so it's, it's a little bit of a weird transition. Uh, a lot of the clients, you know, being that I've just moved back to this area, a lot of places still have not fully opened up. Yeah. Um, so on that side of things, getting clients coming in, you know, at a normal rate is probably going to take a while, yeah. you know, and in that sense, it's going to be a bit of a wash. But I think that's where it's really important as an entrepreneur, not just as a photographer, but just being somebody who runs your own business. You have to have other income streams. You have to have other ways to be able to make money besides just taking pictures of people. Uh, because if obviously COVID-19 hits and it sticks around for a long time, that's going to affect your business. And, and I know a lot of people, not you know just photographers, but people who run salons and, and things of that nature that are now closing up you know, businesses that they've run their entire life because of COVID, just a few months. Are you having any of that oh. kind of photographer's guilt? I know like, you know, because, you know, there's, there's this type of, you know, it's like when you get a job, you know, you want to post about it, you want to stuff. But then again, there's <laughs> a ton of our community that's not working. Like, you know, yeah. part of me is like, you know, it's like when I, when I get a job, I'm like, do I want to put that up? And like, you know, you know, some people are going to be like, oh, that's great. You're working. Like, why is he working? Am I not, I'm not working? Like, he's like, it's yeah. like almost like, oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a battle, you know, in, in some way, um, I, I've never really been that type of guy uh, to really promote the stuff that I'm doing when it comes to my business, yeah. mainly because of what you're saying. Like, I, I know that there's going to be people that will be uplifted by seeing somebody that is doing well and then saying, okay, oh, and they're teaching, maybe I could figure it out for myself. But I do think that um, there's a lot of people that get depressed because they see on social media, people are saying and doing certain things. And, um, you know, obviously they're glamorizing the, the, the highlights and they're not really talking about the negative things that they might struggle with. So I've always been somebody who, when it comes to social media, like I don't like talking about those things. Yeah. You know, I, I look back and, um, you know, like the, the campaign that I did for this eyewear company in January and February of this year, I didn't even barely say anything about it. You know, and that was that was a big thing for me. And yeah. and I was just like, you know, I really don't I don't feel I've never felt good about posting those types of things. Like I do the do the work, you know, I'll share the images, but uh but it's never like, yay, I just made a bunch of money with this client. Like there's some people that um they feel like they have to do that because it's part of their personality, you yeah. know, to like you know, just show people what they did and talk about it. But for me, I've always felt weird about doing that. So um, nothing really changed with COVID in that sense. But, uh, you know, at the same time, I think like, okay, I still need to make things happen. Yeah. I need to find new opportunities. I need to prepare for whatever this post COVID world is going to look like. And, um, and also what that transition period is going to look like as a portrait photographer and, you know, having a studio. So what is that ramp up going to look like? Uh, because so obviously this, that experience this, uh, has to be whole good. kind of COVID quiet down. It's like, are you finding personal projects? Like, I, I know you did something with Sony, and actually, let's take a look at that right now. Mm -hmm. How do you stand out in a way that separates your work from others? And this is a good time to think about that, right? How would you go about figuring out the thing that makes you stand out? When it comes to standing out, it's just a matter of just creating, you know, and and to do it over a long period of time. Uh, I'm not here because I'm the most uh, you know, talented guy or anything like that. I'm here because I persevere because every year 
I push, I try to do something different. And um, I don't know, the world has a way of uh, rewarding people that do that. So uh, communicating with the community and stuff with Sony and, and talking about COVID and, and it is amazing thing. What other things have you done during this and how was the experience with Sony and, and some of the other stuff you've done? Yeah, you know, it was, it was pretty awesome to see a company like Sony that, you know, cares about uh, these types of situations. And it's not, this isn't the first time, you know, I've uh, been fortunate to know, you know, the, the family at Sony for five or six years now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've seen them participate and be active in, you know, their local communities with, uh, you know, for example, supporting um, LGBTQ, you know, uh, events, you know, and, and showing up and sponsoring these events. Um, the you know, female creation to, yeah, I mean, that, right. You know, female fun. with alpha female, you know, empowering. And it, it's kind of an interesting thing. Cause like, I've always looked at, at uh, female creators as being like, you know, the, the, the model for me for like creativity, yeah. you know, most of the most creative people that I know that are photographers are women. So, you know, it's a beautiful thing when a company can, can come and say, okay, um, we're, we're going to shed a light on you and we're going to, we're going to put you up because maybe not everyone thinks like Miguel, you know, maybe there's a lot of people who are like, Oh, girls, whatever, you know? Um, so I, I think it's, it's an amazing thing that a company is, is that active when it comes to uh, social issues. And, and it just makes me super proud to be yeah. you know, a part of that. Um, you know, and I've had the opportunity and they've asked me at times to uh, kind of lend my voice to things that I've always felt very, you know, nervous about that because, yeah. Uh, my my thoughts and my voice is very uh, complicated, you know, and I'm very much like um, I don't fit the mold. But I think that's okay, and especially mm -hmm. if you're speaking from the heart, people want that, and and then sure. and I think it resounds and, and and means a lot more when it when it isn't just so cookie cutter. Yeah, and no, I agree with you, and I think a lot of those conversations, like I have them one on one with people that yeah. you know that that know me and they know my heart and they know that if I'm saying something that I'm not you know, trying to be uh, dismissive or try to be, you know, uh, divisive or anything like that. Um, and I think it's a lot harder on social media. And, and I think maybe for brands and, and companies who have the reach uh, for them to do it and, and give people like me a platform to talk, I think is fantastic. Uh, for me to be able to do it on my own social media, it's, it's, uh, it can be challenging, yeah. you know. Um, a lot of people know me, but not everyone knows you know, my, my upbringing and they don't know kind of my perspective on life and you get bits, you know, bits and pieces and glimpses of it. Um, so it's, it's been an interesting time to say the least. <laughs> what would be one of the most surprising things? Like if you were to tell someone here that they wouldn't know about you, like, no, well, you may not know this, but. Ooh, man, I could probably think of a few. <laughs> um, uh, really good at jump roping. <laughs> <laughs> it's the competitive days back there. Of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ultra, ultra competitive at jump roping. Um, yeah. You know, um, that's a tough question. Cause I feel like there's a lot of stuff. Like I leave yeah. there, there's a public side of me mm -hmm. and then there's like the, the personal private side that I think um, people would be very, very surprised, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a tough one, man. We probably could do like a whole like two or three that'll hour be, episode. That'll, that'll be the open talk follow-up, which I've done. Yeah. My, my very first open talk follow-up with Esteban uh, Toro. Uh, who's oh, wow. Stuff with uh, the Aperture uh, uh, World Series, which is uh, some films that are coming up, short, short films that are beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Oh, that's uh, exciting. But uh, w was there something that uh, wouldn't have been created that was created for you because of COVID, a project or a shoot or, or, or something that was birthed out of because of these circumstances that never would have been um, yeah, you know, I would say because everything had been canceled, you know, events and trips and uh, things of that nature, I had personal projects, uh, you know, especially centered around like photographing my son as he's been, you know, growing up uh, that I couldn't give my full attention to just because I was traveling and, and working that now I have a little bit more time to do. Um, and also as weird as it is, like even just getting my studio set up properly, yep. you know, throughout my life, like I'm not the most organized guy when it comes <laughs> to like my surroundings and, um, every place that I've worked, whether it was like a place and I had a cubicle or I had an office or, you know, I had my studio in New Jersey, I always felt like it was 
running away from me. Like I start to try to do something and then I'm just like, ah, I don't have time. And then it just became this like, and you'll see it in my videos. Like you can see in the background of my, you know, videos, like it was chaos. <laughs> and now being here and, and, and having the opportunity to be like, okay, so how do I want this place to look, you know, and what furniture do I want and where does stuff need to go to be in a place where I don't have to go digging for 10 minutes to try to find it. Um, these are all things that if it wasn't for COVID, I don't know that my studio will end up looking as nice as, uh, you know, and organized, I should say, as uh, it might have looked, you know, if, if it hadn't <laughs> happened. So kind of happy for that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now I have a brand new part of Open Talk. You're the first person I'm doing with. It's called Social Media Pull. I've pulled four photos from your social mm -hmm. media. So we're just going to, you have not seen these. They're bl <laughs> you're going in blind on what I've pulled. Oh, man. Uh, I think you're, you're getting spared because this is my first time doing it. But some people are going to get hit hard with this one. Oh, but, boy. Uh, here we go with the first photo. And, you know, just talk about the first thing uh, that, that comes up or uh, to your mind when you see it. All right. Let me see. Where is, where is this thing at? Here comes the first oh, one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that right there is my reason for doing what I do. Um, that's, that's my son. And uh, you know, it's funny if I can get him to model like this for me when I have my <laughs> camera, I will be so happy. <laughs> Cause every time the camera comes out, he's just like, you know, daddy has a camera. Ooh, I'm not interested. He'll just walk away. But uh, man, you know, I just think those, like, look at those cheeks. Come on. Yeah, man. It's just like, that's, that's the future right there, you know? And yeah. <clears throat> there's this weird uh, switch that, that, that shifts in your, um, in your biology when you have a child. And uh, you know, that's, that's what I think when I see him is just that switch of like yeah. how life is different in, in so many meaningful ways now that he's here. Oh, all right, let's move on to the next photo here. <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah that was me in my uh, uh business sales days working at sprint um matter of fact that photograph uh i was working in uh uh the group actually was in the news recently because uh t-mobile when they took over sprint they axed this group that i was in it was called business inside sales organization bizzo and so, um, so that picture that you see there was my photograph uh, that I took in the conference room. Did you take this yourself? Yeah, it was like one of my friends, <laughs> actually it might've been David, the guy in the beginning that we talked about that yeah. took this photograph. Um, we, were, we had a flash, you know, on camera flash and stood in front of like a, a conference, you know, white room, whiteboard or whatever, and just uh, took the picture. And you know, that was my, my sales days uh, working at Sprint right before I became a photographer oh, full time. Right, it's here crazy. Here comes the next one. I'd buy some phones from that guy. <laughs> yeah. So that was my, uh, my Jersey studio. And, uh, you know, that was really kind of like me trying to use YouTube as a platform for me to be able to tell stories and to, um, you know, give a voice that hopefully people could find useful, you know, the things that I'm, I'm talking about in my experiences and my ups and my downs. Um, this, this video was one where, you know, I told the story that only a few people knew about because it was very embarrassing, uh, you know, because I've heard a million times from people, like if you take pictures, you need to back them up as many times as you can. And, and I, I, I was like, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, you do that. And, you know, then I lost almost all of my images from my entire wow. career at like this and, uh, and realized Perfect. I barely backed it up. So luckily $1,500 later, I was able to recover all of my images. So, and and what, what's your backup now? Oh, I've got tons. I've got a, <laughs> uh, I've got a Synology uh, uh, drive set up. I have two uh, external, these little, uh, I even have it right here. These little Sony portable oh, yeah, hard drives. Yeah. Yeah. I got a four terabyte here. I have a six terabyte on the table. I got a 12 yep. at home. Um, I have these little, uh, let's see, these little SSDs. I mean, I have things backed up probably like 10 times over. Yeah. And I do everything um, on Backblaze as well. <laughs> yes. You got to have it in the, on the cloud as well. 100%. All right. You ready? Here comes the last photo. <laughs> <laughs> wow look at that that kid doesn't have a hand what happened to his hand 
<laughs> Look at that. I grew a hand from whatever happen? age that happen? was. That, that was kindergarten. Was that was me just graduating. Weird photo magic or Photoshop or just Yeah, <laughs> man. They did, see, as a photographer, it was their responsibility to be like, hey, little Miguel, where is your hand? I don't see it. Can you please take your hand out from your sleeve? You know, I probably was doing one of these numbers where I just like, yeah, you know, yeah did this because I was very silly back then. But yeah, this was in uh, Connecticut. I was in a uh, Catholic, one of the Catholic schools. Um, and, and this was graduating uh, kindergarten. Um, yeah, that was, that was a young, young Miguel. It's crazy. Uh, uh, so if you were going to look back and give uh, little Miguel uh, advice, uh, is there anything you would tell him to not do or, or do quicker or what would it be? Yeah, I would have a bunch of advice for him. The first thing I would say is just because the the uh, person is an adult uh, doesn't mean that they have all the answers to everything. Yeah. Um, there is a part of life that is uh, kind of a requirement that you figure things out because your path might be different than someone else's. So I think that was something I needed to understand. I think um, not letting fear dictate the things that you choose to do was a big one. Um, I know as a young person growing up, I was very intimidated by people, um, you know, and, and I think to myself now, like from a physicality standpoint, like most kids don't know how to fight. So living in fear of, you know, saying or doing something because somebody might physically try to mess with you. Most kids don't know how to fight. So just, you know, like, don't be afraid, like do what you got to do, say what you got to say. And, and you're going to be okay. You know, um, and, and the other thing is that, you know, I, I wish I would have really focused on just pushing a little bit harder, you know, back then, because it's not like I couldn't do it. You know, I, I, I got onto this track because of the way that I was raised to just, just get by, you know, just do enough to get by. And literally just pushing on the accelerator, just the teeniest, tiniest bit could have had an, a, a huge explosion of, of growth and things that could have happened. And so... Um, that would definitely be something I would tell, you know, little Miguel with one hand, you know, <laughs> I'll be like, listen, man, just push, push a little bit harder than, uh, than sure what you think I'm you sure can you're do. Passing it on to your son. So that's a hundred percent, hundred percent. So we're coming toward the end of this uh, whole, uh, wonderful talk. And, uh, there's a couple of questions I'd like to ask everybody. And, uh, mm -hmm. then we go into our speed round and that'll, that'll wrap it up. Uh, cool. so what, one of the questions I like asking people is, and it can be pertaining to photography or just life, but there's these things that we hear and uh, and it's usually a piece of advice that either we want to repeat to someone that we use as a mantra or we're going to, you know, you're going to share with your, 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 uh, your child. Uh, what was a piece of advice that uh, was something that travels with you that you would share? Um, you know, there's been a lot of, of, of advice uh, that I've, that I've heard and I've received that has been very helpful. You know, I think, uh, one of the big ones is probably understanding that the reason why most people fail at anything that they do is that they go into it with the wrong expectations. They think that they have to do certain specific things in order to like check those things off the list. And then they end up in a successful situation. And the reality is that, you know, you end up having to do things, you know, eight, 10, 12, 15 times more than what you thought. Um, then, you know, to, to get to that level of success. So, you know, that's something for me that I, I heard when I read the 10 X rule from, from Grant Cardone that, you know, really resonated with me because it was at that point after I read that book that I thought I was already pushing really hard, but I knew I could push harder, you know, and, and, uh, and not just in photography, but in everything that I did, you know, and I could even look back, like, you know, I could give you a, a brief story, but, um, 2009, uh, I was competing and I was, I was trying to get into boxing and I had my second amateur boxing, uh, match and it was here in Orlando, Florida, just a week or two before I started working at Sprint as well, which was great coming to work with a, you know, new job and I'm bruised up and everything. They're like, Whoa, what's up with this guy? But <clears throat> I had trained for this fight for, for many months and fought this guy and I was cruising the entire time and I ended the fight and I distinctly remember at the end of the fight feeling like I had done enough to, to win, but also feeling like I could drop right now and start doing push-ups and hop up and start doing jumping jacks. Like I knew at the end of the fight, I still had so much more physically that I could give. 
but I didn't give it. Yeah. And I lost the fight. So that was one of those things where it was just like, okay, so everything, my mind somehow is wired to think that I, I'm doing just enough to be able to coast by. And sometimes it's enough, but oftentimes it's not. And oftentimes your expectation, your understanding of what is enough to get something done is way off base. It might be off by 10%. It might be off by 20%. For me, it was off probably 50, 60%, right? So that's the biggest thing that I could say is like really looking at everything that you're doing throughout the course of your life and saying, okay, if I think it needs to be like this much work, you really need to think bigger than that. Yeah. Um, and that reminds me of one that, you know, because I usually share one and, uh, and I've always shared the, you know, the one that my father told me is you have two ears and one mouth. Listen a lot more than you speak. <laughs> so that one, that's a big one. Me. But the one that you reminded me of, and, and I'm paraphrasing here in the Japanese culture, there is no, no, it's how do we get to yes. And I thought right. that was a fabulous way. If you always start with, there is no, no, is how do we get to yes. That's the way, you know, people can communicate and get things done. And it's a beautiful Love it. thing to me. Yeah. It's true. Uh, on the simplest or most uh, esoteric terms, what is photography to you personally? I think photography is a way for you to capture life in a way that can be enjoyed by other people or to be analyzed by other people. It's a very formulaic, you know, uh, it could be a very straightforward thing like writing down your thoughts on a piece of paper um, but actually doing it in a way where you have something visual to, to walk away from. And personally, photography to you, like, like what is it, like, like the act of photography and what you do and, and everything, what is it personally to you? Personally to me, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's the key to a world that I would not have ever been a part of. Yeah. You know, ha having the opportunity, I, I sit down and I think to myself over the years, uh, the, the friends, the acquaintances that I've made, the, the people that I've been in rooms with that had it not been for a camera, had it not been for photography, it would be probably no chance whatsoever that we would share the same airspace, you know. Uh, and so I, I, I see photography as an opportunity to, to do things in a way that you probably would never imagine it could be done, you know, to meet people that you never would have thought you could meet to make friends out of people that you may have never thought you would make friends out of, you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. it's uh, I'm sure you've, you've experienced the same types of things as well, but um, it's just a beautiful thing. You know, the, the experiences that I've had and I, it's because of photography, it's because yeah. of a camera. Had I not had that camera in my hand, I don't know that those opportunities would have been, you know, presented yeah. the way they were. So I've adapted this question from one of the final questions of uh, uh, the inside the actor studio. If heaven exists, <laughs> it would obviously have one of the most fabulous galleries in the world, in the heavens, in anywhere. <laughs> Whose opening would you want to attend when you get up there? Ooh, wow. Well, God willing, I do get to attend this. <laughs> um, wow. You know, um, I think I'm sure that there are artists out there that we don't even know about whose history was never documented or, you know, maybe was documented at some point and throughout the course of history, the, the works were destroyed and, and burned. And, you know, um, you just look at something like the collection of Vivian Mare who was found, who was right. all locked up. Just that one thing, that co huge collection that we may have never seen if someone didn't find that work. Yeah. And you know that hers, her, her body of work was not the first, that's just yeah. the first that, you know, in recent memory that we found that we're like, oh my gosh, she had this exhaustive body of work that was so creative and so good. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm thinking over the course of, of human history, how many artists there, there have been that, you know, have this like work that could have transform, transformed our lives, you know, and our outlook on life. And it's gone, you know, it's in a desert somewhere under the ground or it's been burned or it's been frozen in ice somewhere in Antarctica like who knows so I think you know I think for me it would be that it would be that gallery of works that uh, you know wasn't able to impact history because we never got a chance to see it have you shot your uh, gallery opening for heaven yet <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I, I don't think I have yeah. but uh, I'm sure that there will be elements of what I've done up to this point that maybe will, I don't know. I, I think, um, 
you know, the story is, is still being written and, and the work is still being shot. And those little ideas that I have running around in that cranium of mind, uh, they still, they still haven't been executed yet. So um, yeah, maybe one day, I don't know. It'll be interesting right. to see. We're going into speed run right now and it's just a real quick answer, whatever the top of your head, um, texting or talking? Uh, talking. Favorite holiday? Halloween. Favorite junk food? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, favorite junk food? Probably um, pizza. What was your favorite childhood TV show? Uh, favorite childhood TV show? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. All right. Uh, freak or geek? Freak or geek? <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably geek. I mean, I have a Dragon Ball Z. Uh, I, w- I was about to say gamer, all that stuff. And a, and a PlayStation think, yeah. shirt. I'm going to say geek on that one. Um, what profession other than one uh, photographer would you like to try? Uh, pro wrestling. Pro wrestling, nice. Mm-hmm. What is a, fa- uh, a, a taco fold? Taco fold. Reflector. Ah! <laughs> pa, 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 pa. Taco oh. fold. There it is. Nailed it. Star Trek or Star Wars? Ooh, man, you're going to try to get me killed here. Uh, <laughs> um, I would say new Star Trek, like J.J. Abrams' Star Trek. Have you watched the new series? Like Discovery? Yes. And, and, yeah, I'm, I'm yes. liking them. Yeah. I'm digging it. I was not a big Star Trek fan growing up. Yeah. I would have said, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I would have said Star Wars by a country mile. But, uh, you know, the new Star Trek is, is it's all pretty good. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Uh, no. Absolutely. Uh, toilet paper over or under? Oh, definitely over. <laughs> People who do this under stuff, man. That's like, you, you want to see me rage? Get me in a toilet stall, like one of these small stalls, and the, the paper is under, and I got to sit here and keep hitting the thing to try to get it started when I'm just trying to get the heck out of there. Especially if it's like a public bathroom, and there's somebody lighting up the toilet next to you, and I'm trying to get the heck out of there. It better be over, because I need to be quick. I need to get out of there. <laughs> last question something in that room that you'd have to use for your weapon in the apocalypse what is it look around where is it what do you Ooh. pull um it would probably end up being bam leatherman <laughs> leatherman awesome pow i love it you cut a lot of zombies with that um this is the last question i want to thank you for your time and joining us in open talk and, and all you have to share um where can people find your work uh, you can find me at miguelquiles.com. And if you search my name, Miguel Quiles, on YouTube, I have content uh, throughout the interwebs. Uh, also on Instagram, at Miguel Quiles Jr. And I think pretty much all my social media is all uh, Miguel Quiles Jr. And we'll be putting all the links below in the in Yes. The, in the come more visit. Stuff. Come have a conversation. Like I said, I read comments. So yeah. good, bad, or ugly. You, if, you, if you are interested in photography and if you haven't taken one of his uh, workshops and when we get back to normal and he's giving them, take one because he is so giving in his information and sharing of everything. It's, uh, it's well worth uh, that and 10 times more. Uh, last Thanks. question before we leave, uh, I like to ask and leave on a high note um, of all the things you've seen recently in this world, what was something you saw that gave you hope or made you smile? Hmm. Um, you know, the fact that we're still here, I, I feel like it, it gives me hope. You know, when you can have a, a, a virus like this that shuts down, you know, the biggest economy out there, uh, when you can world. have, you know, um, these terrible things that happen in life that, that are now under a, you know, magnifying glass, um, you know, happening in these little communities and big communities and, and having impact in the way that it is. I mean, um, the fact that we're still here, you know, and that we're still talking and we're still, you know, <laughs> we're still interacting with one another, you know, and not just like destroying things and, and you know, that we're not living in the walking dead, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, I, I, to me, that gives me hope because I think that all of this is all going to be something that uh, just like other you know, times in history that maybe have had it even worse than we did. Uh, it's all going to be stuff that's going to fade into memory and, and it's either going to make us grow or, you know, it's going to, uh, you know, drive us into a hole. So uh, I take hope in the fact that, uh, 
we're still here. We're able to do this, you know, interview and, and even with the distance that we have in between us that we have the technology to be able to do this. And, you know, hopefully the, the stuff that, um, you know, that they hear through, you know, this show, uh, not just with me, but with other guests that you have, that it brings them, you know, hope and encouragement and, um, you know, just makes them understand that uh, life is going to be okay. Um, thank you, Miguel, my brother. I, uh, you are only in the infancy of your photo career, so I can't wait to see what comes in the next years to come. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you so much, and all my best to you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me.